after weeks of buzz about his arrival. No, we're not talking about Howard Weissman in Santa Maria, California. We finally had a Larry King sighting. But the jury was not allowed to hear from Mr. King, and his appearance in the courtroom was probably shorter than a commercial on CNN. Did he say that this woman told him she wanted money? No. I think he said uh, he thinks she wants money. Did he say what he based that opinion on? No. Did you ask him? No. He just said she was a wacko. That he said wacko a couple times, and he said that she's in it for the money. When he said she was a wacko, did you ask Mr. Feldman what he meant? No. I think that's self-explanatory. No further questions. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Zonin. You may sit down, Mr. Mesero. I'm not going to cut off examination, but at this point, I don't see any reason to allow Mr. King to testify. I have no questions. All right. Based on the offer of proof, I don't find Mr. King's testimony would impeach Mr. Fellman, based on the record that you presented in your points and authority, so I'll disallow his testimony. Now, explain that in English. Offer, proof, impeachment. What's this judge talking about? Howard. Well, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> Professor. Scholar. I, I think he should have been allowed to testify. Larry Feldman testified. One of the reasons he testified was to, to uh, um, corroborate the credibility of Janet and, yeah. and to give us some legitimacy to the claim. This witness says, wait a minute, I talked to Feldman. He said they were wackos and they were in it for the money. It contradicts the prosecution's theory and, and bolsters the defense theory. And it should have been all, all or nothing. The, either the judge allows all of it, allows Larry Feldman to testify for the prosecution as he did, and then allows the defense, or he doesn't allow it at all because it's irrelevant. But you can't... But it was a rather technical point that the judge rested his uh, decision it, yeah. on. He says, essentially, this is simply opinion by Larry Feldman of what he thought about the accuser, and he did not divulge confidential information, which was the cross-examination question that Mesro asked. Didn't you divulge confidential information? Larry Feldman says, I would never do that. That's the technical fine point that he rested this on. Well, I think that the judge had a way out on, as you put it, the technical fine point. The difficulty in this case, which Sean just points out, as well as Howard, is we have opinion testimony yeah. in this case on both sides that none of the four of us understand how it went in. People are allowed to have opinions about the character of witnesses, about their likability, about their credibility, and so it's one more piece of this. None of it should have come in. And isn't Larry Feldman, having dealt with this woman as a client, in the best position to opine about whether she's just in it for the money? Well. Moving on, Larry King did not testify, but Aja Pryor did. Pryor and her former fiancé, Chris Tucker, tried to help the accuser's family following Gavin's diagnosis with cancer. Okay. And did you develop a relationship with Janet? Yes. And could you please describe that relationship? The relationship that I had with Janet was based on the love that I shared for her children. It's hard for me because I really do love the kids a lot. Would you like some water? Do you want a little water? Are you okay? I'm okay. Because of the love I have for her children and because of Gavin's sickness, and I'm a mother myself, I, that's how we became, I wouldn't say friends, but it was, there was a mutual feeling there that she could talk to me about a lot of things. Okay. Regarding her children, and I really did love her kids. Okay. And did she talk to you from time to time about her children? Yes. Did Janet ever ask you for any help for the children? No. Did Janet ever ask you for any kind of assistance for her family? No. Did you ever give the family any assistance? Do you mean monetarily? Sure. Yes. When was this? I gave them a Christmas gift of $600. And what led up to that gift? I knew that it was a really hard time for them. This would have been after Davlin's graduation. And I found out that Janet had been being abused by her husband. And that he had left and taken the car and left them with no money. Did Janet tell you she was left with no money? Yes. And did she tell you she didn't have a car? Yes. Yet another individual who gave money to this woman around Christmas time 
I guess we can assume it's the same Christmas time period because that's when all this stuff develops. It was a gift. She liked her. They were friends. She loved these kids. It's very appropriate this for her. a lot of money. I, it doesn't matter. I mean, in that sense, this was a woman and this witness, and Aja Pryor, who really had a bonding with Janet and gave them a $600 Christmas present. There's nothing possibly wrong well, with yeah, that. Well, yeah, that perhaps from the point of view from the giver, but how about the give E, the woman on the receiving end? Two what, is she ten say, grand don't, checks. Don't give me Christmas presents. But doesn't that buy into the prosecutor or the defense theme of uh, this woman soliciting this money? Yes. And also, con artists are generally very charming. The, the way that they're successful is they pull people in, and yeah. people feel for them and want to give to them, and that fits in, too. With you the had a child who was dying person. of cancer, for heaven's sake. I mean, if there are pictures of this youngster at that time in his life, which should have broken all our hearts. Well, certainly, but at the same time, we heard testimony that... No one other than uh, so perhaps a movie star, uh, Chris Tucker, and I think his brother through this testimony, were at the kids' hospital room where it was you know New what? Year's Eve. Yeah, this witness right. was a very credible witness. She loved the kids. She was totally taken in by the family, whether for con or for legitimate reasons. And I, I thought this was, witness was a great witness for the defense. Yes. Could this witness serve any useful purpose for the prosecution? Well, indeed so, because she loves the kids. It's clear she does. So just because Janet may be a bit loopy, to use my word, <laughs> the reality is she loved the children. And what? the children, or at least Gavin, is the victim oh, here, Lord. if the jurors yep. believe yep. it. Hold yep. that thought, Sean Chapman and Holly, okay. when we return. Does Aja Pryor back up Janet's testimony or back the prosecution into a corner. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. As Chris Tucker's ex-girlfriend, Aja Pryor, continues her testimony, does she make Janet's concern about being sent to Brazil really sound all that bad? Here's how the jurors heard it according to the courtroom transcripts. Did Janet ever mention a trip to Brazil to you? Yes. What did she say? She said that they... I'll object as hearsay. Impeachment, Your Honor. The objection is overruled. She said that they were going to Brazil for Carnival. And what is Carnival, to your knowledge? Beautiful costumes, beads. I guess it's kind of like Mardi Gras. Kind of a holiday celebration, right? A holiday celebration. Did she ever ask you to go with her? Yes, she did. And when did Janet ask you to go to Brazil with her to attend Carnival? During a phone conversation. It was sometime in February. Okay. And did you say anything in response to her invitation? I said, sure, I'd love to go. Okay. Uh, did she ever tell you that she had learned that Michael Jackson was not going to Brazil? Yes, I believe she did. Do you know approximately when that was? It would have been in early March. Okay. Was she upset about that? No. Okay. Did she still, as far as you know, plan to go to Brazil? By this time, I don't think she wanted to go. Okay. Was that... Did she tell you she didn't want to go because she found out Michael wasn't going? Object. That's a leading question, Your Honor. Sustained. Did Janet tell you why she no longer wanted to go to Brazil? Because there were a lot of unknowns. Her children had just been out of school for one month. She didn't know when they were going back to school. She didn't know exactly where they, she was staying in Brazil. Did she ever tell you she had canceled the trip? No, I don't remember when we stopped talking about Brazil. Boy, what a sight. Michael Jackson in Brazil, carnival, full costume. Who wouldn't want to see that? Next, what did the accuser's mother think about responding to the Bashir documentary? Did she ever complain about having to do any interview for a rebuttal documentary? No. As a matter of fact, she was happy to do the rebuttal video. Please explain what you mean. She was very upset about the uproar that, the, that had been caused by this documentary. Not only that her children had been taped without permission, but that the relationship, the friendship that her son had with Michael, was taken completely out of context and made, and made into something that was bad. She was upset about that. And she told you that? She told me that. Okay. Now, when did she tell you she was happy to do an interview for the rebuttal documentary? Her exact words were not, I'm happy to do this, but she was very excited about doing it. She was very anxious to do it, to tell the world that this friendship was nothing more than what they saw, a beautiful friendship, and that's it. She used those words to you? 
She used the word beautiful friendship before in regards to Michael. Yes. I don't know in this specific conversation if she used it. Beautiful friendship, no scripting, no forcing. This is where the coercion count comes in, or the extortion count, rather, in that first count comes in. Where is it? Well, the only thing that I, I wanted to say in response to something Ricky had said is about the kids. And yes, I think we can feel for Gavin, and we do. It's the mother. It's the mother that's a problem. It's a mother that's the con artist. And I think that it's been proven that the mother cannot be believed. And to the extent, as I've said before, that she has an influence over these kids, that's the credibility con issue for the jurors. According, according to the defense. But it gets back to what, what I've been saying all along. If they don't put on the false imprisonment, if they don't put on the kidnapping, and we're left to determine whether or not we want to believe Gavin or not, right. it's a whole different situation. When you throw all the other stuff in, it changes uh, all of the look and feel of the case. Indeed it does, and I do think, and I think we all agree that that may have been overreaching for the prosecution, and it may be really their death now. But one of the things that Mr. Snedden did have is this. In addition to his perhaps belief of Janet's uh, story when she was uh, in front of him, he also has the passport applications. He winds up with the tickets. He winds up with the surveillance. There's all kinds of things that for him as a prosecutor could have led him to believe that this was not only a legitimate claim, but that, these, that at least sure. the mother was really in Sure. Let's take that one step further and talk about what we know to be discovery. It's pretty clear, and no one in the viewing audience should wonder whether or not Tom Snedden and the prosecution knew what this woman was going to well, say. Boy, they know up front, don't they? If they knew what this woman was going to say, I can't think of a stronger reason not to put on that false imprisonment and conspiracy case. This is a wonderful witness, and she just blows that whole concept out of the water. I agree with you, but let's back it up. Don't they know? Wouldn't they know as a, re as a result of exchanging information before the trial start exactly what this woman is going to e say? Even if they didn't well, get any so. kind of statement from Tom Mesereau or the defense, certainly this is a witness that the government would have interviewed. I mean, this is not, we're not in the days any longer of surprise, surprise, right. I spring a witness on you. The rules of evidence in California and most other states allow, you got to let the other side know what you're going to do. Yeah, wouldn't they even know the source of the surveillance videos that it came from Mr. Garagos's investigator? Mm -hmm. Don't they know? Know all As of that James anytime. Curtis right. would say, the details, the details, and really, the devil is in the detail, and the devil doesn't seem to be surfacing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that, James Curtis. He's so darn witty. Ha. As Asia Pryor continues her testimony, she describes the relationship between the accuser's mother and the king of pop a bit differently than Janet did. Is there anything else she told you about Michael and her family that you remember? Janet told me the same thing about Michael as she said about Chris and I. She praised Chris and I to the point where it made me uncomfortable, saying that we were sent, we, we were angels, and how we just have done so much for her family. And while I believe that we did provide our children with happiness and maybe love that they were not receiving from the other parent, David, you know, me as, as a woman, I feel uncomfortable because I'm a human being, you know? And I would tell her all the time, Janet, stop, stop. I'm only doing a sheer documentary. And what did she say about that? Exactly what you just said, that Michael had helped cure her son and that this is what a beautiful friendship they have. Now, on cross-examination, District Attorney Tom Stenton wonders if the witness's relationship with the accuser's family was just a one-way street. You mentioned giving the family a cashier's check for Christmas as a present, correct? Correct. And that was in the year 2001 for the Christmas 2001? Yes. And you sent that to them with a nice Christmas card and a note, right? I'm sure I did, yes. And as a matter of fact, they also gave you some Christmas presents and gift certificates for your son, uh, correct? Uh, do you recall that? I remember them giving me gift certificates. I don't know when it was, if it was that Christmas or Mother's Day. They would send me gifts from time to time, different holidays. So the feeling between you and the kids was that it was one of uh, that close, that you would actually exchange gifts and pleasantries with each other, correct? Correct. Ricky Kleeman, I've got to wonder at this juncture whether or not, or if they do, how much of a rebuttal case we're going to be looking at, given how extensive this defense case is. Well, also in California, prosecutors tend to do large rebuttal cases. And I also think that Tom Snedden doesn't have an in him to just say, okay, it's enough. I'm not going to put on any rebuttal case. I think we're in for a while. Now, what, that, what could that look like? Where would you go, putting you in the prosecution shoes for a second, where would you go? 
with a rebuttal case if you put one on. You know what? I, w I would try to get some of the details that you and I have spoken about yeah. if the details exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. Yeah. So what about you, John? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. They, everybody, both sides have been ridiculously thorough at this point. Okay. I can't really imagine where they go on rebuttal, though I agree that they're going to put on a rebuttal. Now, let's take that point up with respect to these jurors, something that I'll just make up a word, juror fatigue. There comes a point. <laughs> Very important. And it's also, we have to remember, we have Memorial Day coming up. We have July 4th coming up. Yeah. These are things that jurors think about, about being with their families. So they have to be mindful of this stuff. They really, really and do, also, because they'll turn off, won't they? Also, they know the district attorney's office in this case is driving the case. They put on the lengthier case. I, I hope the defense rests sooner rather than later. All right, we're going to see what exactly happens with that when we return. Defense attorney Tom Mazzaro doesn't rest, but he gives us his very best. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. It's time for our clip of the week. Aja Pryor and her then fiance, actor Chris Tucker, befriended the accuser's family when it looked like they really could use some help. But Defense Attorney Tom Mesro uses prior to methodically refute the testimony of Gavin's mother. Here's how it went down in the courtroom according to the courtroom transcripts. Did Janet ever tell you that Michael Jackson had falsely imprisoned her? No. Did Janet ever tell you that Michael Jackson had kept her family against their will? No. Did Janet ever tell you that Michael Jackson had extorted her family? No. Did Janet ever tell you that Michael Jackson was in a conspiracy to commit crimes against her family? Absolutely not. And you were talking to her on a regular basis in February 2003, right? Yes. And would that be daily? I don't remember if it was daily. And again, if I got calls, sometimes they were from Davlin and sometimes they were from Janet. Now. When Janet called you in February of 2003, did she ever tell you she was being forced to go to any location? No. Did Janet ever tell you she was being forced to get into anyone's car and go anywhere? No. Did Janet ever tell you in February of 2003 that her children were being forced to travel to various locations no. by anybody? No. Did Janet ever tell you that she was forced to do any interview about Michael Jackson? Never. Did Janet ever tell you that her family was forced to rehearse lines that they were then to articulate in an interview about Michael Jackson? No. Did Janet ever tell you that she or her family were given scripts to memorize no. for an interview? No. We are in week, what is it, 12 of this case, three and a half weeks into the defense case. It seems the defense is leaving no stern, stern, stone dog on it unturned in this case. What else are they going to do? Well, I think they can continue to do what they're doing here, which is beat the heck out of the first count, the conspiracy and false imprisonment. You know, something occurred to me. It'd be a little dramatic, but the district attorney could get up at the end of this case and say, you know what? I'm dismissing the first cause of action or the first count and say, but I, but I, in his argument, I believe oh, the boy, yeah. I the believe the testimony, thing and one do. thing has nothing to do with the other. Maybe Janet wasn't credible. That doesn't mean Michael Jackson. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the deal. That is huge. That's what I Dismiss would do. the first count. The first count is the false imprisonment extortion count. That only leaves the molestation counts. That would be a brilliant move. That would be brilliant and effective. And if Tom Snedden is watching and does that, and Michael Jackson's convicted, we can <laughs> all yeah, yeah, well. I, I want to go back to a point you made <laughs> a, a long idea, time ago, many, many weeks ago. Sean had said that one of the good reasons for having the, uh, from the prosecution's point of view, for having the false imprisonment count is that it gave the jurors, to use your words, a way to split the baby. Yeah. Meaning that they could acquit and feel good about something, that they did something, they said, okay, you didn't prove this, yeah. while they then convict on the molestation. And I think that the conventional wisdom would be that the prosecution dares not be so bold. Well, well I don't know, but it makes them like the good guy, though, doesn't Tom it? Tom Snedden, I don't know if he's got the ability to do it, could take the arrogance and the kind of clumsiness out of his presentation and say, ladies and gentlemen, I made a mistake. Now that I've looked Your at the point. evidence and... Give him the credibility. Right, like, leave yeah. it right there. That's it good. for the week. But don't forget, we're he here each weeknight, 7.30 p.m. I'm so blown away that, by that brilliant idea brilliant. by Art Weissman. E.